real yields are finally back. The U.S. has to sell over $500 million billion worth of treasury bills in the next few weeks here and uh, up to $1.3 trillion of treasury bills until the end of the year, all short dated and all have yields around 5% or more. Inflation, as we all know now, is around 4% these days, depending on what number you want to look at. So real yields are a thing again. But gold is holding it up. We're seeing a divergence. Gold price is hanging in there around 1930, 1935 right now. It's still range bound, but it hasn't broken down. And uh, we've seen something similar in September 2022. So I'm curious now, is this going to hold? Are we going to break to the downside? Or actually, are we going to see a rally in the gold price? And uh, I've inv invited a fund manager to the program. It's uh, Eric Strand. He's the founder and portfolio manager over at AUAG Funds in Sweden. And uh, they have run four funds focused on precious metals and green and energy metals. I'm really curious to hear how he runs his fund, but also how he sort of sees the market and puts some context around us. Because one of their slogans is for a sound world and a sound financial system. So I'm really curious how that all fits together for him and uh, how it fits into the overall thesis. Eric, it's great to see you again, my friend. It's, uh, it's welcome back on SOAR Financially. Yeah, really nice to have this uh, call and... Uh... We have a lot of interesting topics to talk about. Yes, nice. Absolutely. We'll we'll see if we can all fit it in because uh, there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, I was going to start with a with a bit of a fun question, Eric. Uh, just based on what I'm seeing in the markets, how much fun is it to be a fund manager in precious metals these days? Uh, are you enjoying yourself, and uh, are you looking forward to the summer holidays? No, well, I actually have no holidays. So as a fund manager, you have to be on top of it all of the time. So there is no way no way to hide. And of course, I've been in the business and uh, in the markets, so I know I know it goes down, and uh, we just have to see that as an opportunity to 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 buy even more shares. Absolutely. So it's, uh, but of course, it feels in the stomach every day. You see the, these red numbers. What is happening now? And uh, that's hard, but uh, that's when you have to be strong. So that's why I pra actually practice a lot of uh, tough yoga. <laughs> uh, to be strong uh, uh, when it's hard uh, when it's easy being a fund manager is really easy but when it's hard you have to to be strong you have to believe in your case uh, and to really uh, that's what you have to put in front of you the case good, good point we'll discuss that case now i think as well because it fits in in the overall discussion eric mm -hmm. um let, let's start with an overall like all-encompassing question like how do you see the state of the economy these days and uh, w where are we at right now in the cycle if you would so so to speak What's your impression of the markets? Yeah, as you said, we are believers in a sound financial system. Uh, on the other hand, we never believe that that will happen. Uh, and that's why gold and silver is the, the second best thing. Uh, I mean, in a sound system, you actually wouldn't need to invest in gold and silver, but we won't have it. So gold and silver is really, really the way to go to protect yourself. Uh, not just now, but uh, probably for the long time coming. So... Uh, and we see this uh, money printing and debt creations going on, going on, and uh, everything is saved with uh, liquidity. I mean, it's already started 2008. I mean, we should have lowered debts in the world after that, and now they are more than two times uh, level. So, so we are not just putting in more liquidity, and then we have some uh, quantitative tightening and so on, but that's always for a short term. And what we see now is... Uh, I mean, rates have probably peaked or very close to peaking in, in the U.S. And I like to see this. I have a graph where uh, gold actually is rather strong also when they raise the rates. And of course, even stronger when, when they lower them again. So, And actually, in this very strong uh, rate cycle going up, uh, gold is up 9%. So it hasn't been a bad investment uh, when people would believe it would be bad. So... Uh, and now they're on the top. They can only go down almost from here. And I think then uh, gold will really fly. So so, so gold has shown strength, I would say, yeah. being so strong in that environment. Yeah, Let, Let's dr drill down a bit on the Fed fund rate cycle a little bit, just because uh, we've seen sort of that the miners in particular, and we'll get to those in, in more specifically, um, have suffered. Risk capital sort of dried up when the Fed started raising rates last March. It was around March 16th, 17th. We saw it directly. Financings disappeared. Um, but but gold has done OK, as you said, like 9% up. Um Question is now, like, how is gold reacting? Like, we've seen a few rally, like, we've seen a rally, like, until January, where gold almost ran to an all time high. It, it sort of bounced off three times from there, um, but it didn't break through. 
because the Fed came back said, "Hey, we're going to keep raising rates." Right? And now they've said they've kept that door open for two more rate hikes later this year, um, sort of shutting the door on gold again. That's what we're seeing. I think that's what the price action in gold sort of shows us. Um, how do you see the situation? Like, and, and how do you see the Fed moving forward, given what we're seeing in the markets? Yeah, of course, on this uh, little part that with the investors that are more speculating in gold, it's hard to go, to go maybe really long uh, as the Fed can talk. I mean, talk is cheap. So it's very easy for them to say that they are going to raise rates and, and like managing in the markets a little bit. But we are really getting close where that talk will not come true. And uh, I think uh, people really, uh, that, that will make the market fly. But again, they made it. We're not going to raise rates, but uh, we will do it a little bit later. We have two more rate hikes possible and so on. But I mean, that's just talk. And uh, actually, they shouldn't be allowed to talk about that. They should just <laughs> raise rates or lower rates or, or keep them on their meetings. Uh, I think this talking is has been good for them for a while. But uh, I think they talk too much and that would become a problem for them that they talk so much about the future uh, when they don't fulfill it. Now, my gut feeling, just listening to what uh, Powell said last last week here as well, it just sounded very hollow. It sounded like an excuse just to just to reel the market in a little bit, just to keep yeah. it. Yeah, I think they're, they're getting weak. And the problem with the Fed or central banks is they always go too far. So they lower rates for too long, and then they raise rates for too long uh, because they want an excuse to lower. I mean, they, knew, they know they will have to lower rates. Uh, but they need the excuse to do it. They won't do it like to try to to make it soft. They will something more breaks in the system, and then then they have to lower it. And it's not their fault that they are lowering it because they have to do it. So I, I think they're waiting for the big excuse. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if commercial real estate will be the thing in the U.S. that that really uh, uh, make them yeah. more pain. It's just like re retail housing yesterday came out uh, quite surprisingly that uh, house permits or housing permits for new builds shot up by tw over 20% yesterday. I was a bit surprised. And it uh, brings me a bit to the, the, the recession topic here as well, because we're all looking for indicators that a recession is around the corner. But uh, all the big indicators like jobless numbers and now housing as well aren't showing a recession in the, in the near future. Like, where, where do you stand on that topic? Well, first of all, I think the reports are a bit strange. I mean, if you look on them and if you read the whole part and uh, how this uh, birth death rates comes on your reports and so on, because it's really hard to believe that you have less and less unemployment, but in the news, you only see companies uh, doing layoffs and, and still we have more more or less people uh, unemployed. So I think that's a little bit, uh, these numbers are really hard to believe sometimes. Uh, so, so, so I don't take them that. Uh, I mean, they are not that important for me because I know they are not really, really true, and that distorts the market. Uh, because even if you, as you said before, if you have an inflation, now it's down to this and this percent, but in reality, you don't see it at that percent. So, so uh, and I think they they like to to have uh, reporting the inflation at three or four percent, but actually it's five or six percent. Uh, because in the end, we have so much depth in the system, and, and the one way to get rid of depth is to have inflation. So I think also there they like to say uh, we are fighting inflation, but I mean, they actually want inflation. Uh, and if they reach their target that they have set 2% inflation, uh, as you said, we may have real rates for a short while. It always happens for a short while, but uh, in average, they need a negative real rate at half percent to one percent so when they are at two percent we will have rates at one or one and a half percent no absolutely it's sort of the the treasury like the interest payments on all the t-bills like if you have to pay five percent or i think one of them is five point two two seven percent five point three percent that is extremely high and i think the the interest payments and brian london but um, i'm sure you're familiar with as well the us has been talking a lot about okay eventually it'll become a political issue because we have to pay a trillion dollars or not we but the us has to pay a yeah. trillion dollars in interest payments every year at least and that's when it becomes political because that number is just too 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 high and not financeable anymore no and, and i mean they they run deficits uh, and a lot big deficits so so uh... But they can do that. They can print money and they can do a lot of things. Uh, but it's a, 
people have as long as there is trust in them and their system they can do it and uh, i'm sure we won't see a big recession because they will print money or the state will do big projects whatever it is to support the system because uh, no politicians want to see a, a, a hard recession so when it when it crashes more i mean we saw the banks uh, and I think I don't think that's really solved. It has been quiet about the banks, but as I said, commercial real estate uh, and all people that have to pay this uh, have this high cost. It, it will be a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, and uh, then they will start again. The, the printing press is really hard to save the system, and uh, of course, for gold and silver, that that will be a big one. A lot of empty office buildings, hotels being given back to the banks and lenders. I've been seeing that in the news all over. So really curious how that plays out. Um, and, and then, yeah, and then I have one more thing that I think is in, in the macro that I, I've been thinking on, on the last month or so. And that was uh, like uh, this war in Ukraine, Russia war. Uh, we say that we don't uh, buy any Russian uh, things. But when you see it, all, all the commodities from Russia is going into the world. Without them, the world wouldn't work. Uh, because I thought they were sanctioned. But we need this titanium and the oil goes to China or India and then it goes back to Europe somehow. Uh, and then I understood that uh, uh, Europe or US, they were happy with that because they just wanted the prices to be lower so the income for Russia would be lower, so not to totally to stop the imports into the world's system uh, and that made sense and of course that is then a pressure on the prices uh, not just on oil but i mean it comes into the metals as well uh, so i mean if russia has to sell it as a with a 25 or 35 percent rebate uh, that will of course uh, make things in the market because some parts of the market are buying these metals or oil cheaper than the real market uh, that puts pressure on the price so i think maybe also when we see that disappear if we one day would hopefully get a piece or something uh, that wouldn't ha be there anymore no more cheap uh, cheaper commodities than they should be uh, coming out from russia and uh, i think that's good for the prices for gold and silver and other metals yeah it's interesting that the u.s can actually turn a profit refilling the strategic petroleum reserves uh, they they sold them I think at a, a couple uh, ninety three dollars I think and now they're replenishing at seventy three or something like that so they're actually making twenty dollars a barrel uh, in profit paper profits right so really interesting um, that development um, Eric I want to circle back to gold based on like what we yeah. discussed on 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 the macro side now um, and personally I'm a bit puzzled or puzzled is like maybe the wrong word but. A surprise to a degree that gold is actually hanging in there quite well. Um, we've seen quite a bit of volatility, but now the last six weeks we've been really range bound, right? Um, we've jumped up from 1860, now we're in 1930, I think, but it's been range bound for the last six yeah. weeks, I think. Why, why is gold holding up so well? And uh, what are some of the cases maybe for, for a breakdown to the downside and maybe for a breakout to the upside as well? Well, now I almost only see to the upside. Uh, I mean, we had this period before the before the debt uh, limit, the discussion because I think uh, uh, the market was a bit, or the FX traders, currency traders, they were a bit nervous that uh, if it would, wouldn't be solved, the risk was. Uh, I mean, the U.S. markets would be hit hard, equity markets and all markets, but other markets or other countries would be hit even harder, even if it was not their problem. So I think they got long dollars uh, in, in before the debt limit was resolved. Uh, so that was like a headwind for gold uh, or uh, against gold. So after that, I think we have solved that. It's over. And I think that makes it easier for gold to rise. But uh, it's time now for gold to really go through 2000 and stay there. Uh, and I think when we reach 2100, it, it will have a lot of space uh, or room going up from there. So... Uh, Actually, I think uh, now is the time, really time. I mean, it has been this struggle or nothing really happening. And uh, and the miners, of course, they get hit also when the equity market goes down. And I think we also have seen this uh, tech hype suddenly again uh, and making the money flows going. All, all new money or fresh money goes into to tech companies, uh, the big ones, a, AI, we are AUAG, but you know you have to add AI. 
uh, even if we like human intelligence more than uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think uh, there is, I mean, you said, as you said, money has dried up and all new money goes into this, uh, hunting these uh, tech companies at the moment. So, and I think that will be over because, I mean, they are really overpriced. No, I put a tweet out yesterday about the S&P 500 and the performance, 12-month performance of some of the stocks. I think top performer was about 180% up. Newmont at, uh, four, uh, ranked 485th with a negative 30% return over 12 months, right? So that just shows you, like, if, if I, I call it, I think our top dog was a, is a real dog as well, right? <laughs> um, which is, how do you get excited about a space if your biggest company in the sector is completely underperforming? Yeah, and with a good dividend and so on. Now it's really interesting, but also the whole American market. I think, I mean, it's like ten companies is making the market being seven. Strong. I think so it's, it's seven. Yeah, I, I mean, actually read it this seven. morning. <laughs> so let's go for seven. <laughs> <laughs> I actually read yeah, it this so morning. It's a really, really strange market, uh, and uh, a lot of things can happen when that turns. So I don't know what's going to turn negative on on tech, but uh, I mean, small tech companies they have big problems with these uh, interest rates. Of course, the bigger ones they can, they they can live with it but uh, that has also changed i think within tech you have big tech old tech and small tech now boring rates of uh, you know seven eight nine percent also is, is, is a struggle for the miners to be honest as well looking at development projects right um uh, on the other hand i mean i mean we create a lot of i mean they are really value trades i mean uh the possibility to in, invest now i mean it, it's it's great so even if the charts don't look great it makes the investment much better I think gold is at an inflection point again as well. It's like I've been looking at a couple charts this morning in in preparation of our conversation, and it's about the gold to GDX ratio or GDX to gold ratio is sort of hitting a trend line as well. Uh, what, thinking... what what is in, what is interesting there, Kai, is uh, I like to speak about that because I mean the dollar has been strong with their rate hikes. They were first, of course, and it, you will have the opposite on the other side when they start to to make the pause and then go down. That will be uh, making the dollar a bit weaker. And what is interesting, if you invest in miners instead of the gold, is like uh, if if you just play with the, that miners are a leverage of two with the uh, with the gold commodity. Uh, if the gold price goes up twenty percent and then the miners forty percent in U.S. dollars, and uh, maybe the euro goes up ten uh, percent vs the dollar, uh, as I said before. Uh, on gold, you would have a ten percent return in Europe, but on the miners, you would have forty minus ten, thirty percent. So, so the leverage for uh, minor mining investors in Europe is really interesting in this uh, kind of environment. Um, just, just random side question: Where do you buy? Do you buy on the home exchange or do you buy in Stockholm? Where, where, where do you buy when you buy for the fund? Uh, we only buy on actually on the U.S. exchange. Uh, some in London, but mostly the U.S. and US. some can Canada. I mean. If we have them on the U.S. exchange, I mean, if we are there for liquidity. We want liquid stocks so we can buy and sell. So U.S. Times, yeah, most of some sense. Australian companies as well. Makes sense. Um, we, we talked a lot about gold, obviously, but your flagship fund is the Silver Bullet Fund, right? So we, we got to talk about silver as well and this, the dynamics of, of the silver price. Uh, let me just look at the commodity here. We're trading at 2303 right now. Um, so we've been coming down a little bit again like how how do you see silver trading these days like what's your silver outlook well i do really really like gold and its properties but uh, i love silver so uh, and that is why the silver bullet fund is our flagship fund and our first fund and really in my heart and of course they all are about the silver bullet <laughs> fund is there and of course it's uh, i mean silver is such a unique metal uh, being both monetary metal and industrial metal uh, and what you can see uh, with silver is that we are going for a physical shortage and a physical shortage on an indispensable metal. I mean, that would make prices fly. We can't see that in gold, uh, a physical shortage, but you can see it, we'll see it in silver. And you cannot do anything without silver in the world. It's the second most used commodity and you use very little silver in a computer, in a car, but you need it. And that makes the price... Uh, inelastic so when even if it gets really really expensive to 100 percent, 200 percent, 300 percent more it still doesn't change the price of the car but you cannot do the car without the silver uh, so i think uh, the dynamics for silver and a uh, dramatic uh, price rise is really really strong 
on the other hand, we have had the COMEX uh, managing the market. So, so that has been a big problem for the silver price to fly. And uh, of course, again, that's again an opportunity because if the price would normally have been at 50 now, uh, the potential would not be as much as uh, as it sits at now at 23. So uh, we just have to see that this managing disappears. I mean, we have seen the fines for JP Morgan and the other ones. Uh, and I mean, the commercials have been going short on the COMEX, big volumes. Uh, and then they have done these uh, spoofing trades. And then they've been buying back from the technical funds that have been selling uh, and then, so they have always gone long on the way down and they go short on the way up. And they've been, been allowed to do this for such a long time. Uh, and if I'm informed correct, JP Morgan has stopped this and they are long. And it's Bank of America that is sitting on the short positions and are in trouble if, if the prices fly. But uh, of course, they would do everything to, to stop that. And they have deep pockets. Very deep pockets. <laughs> Very, but uh, very... what is interesting is that you may see that uh, if JP Morgan is long and and they want to to double cross another big bank uh, and maybe if they can buy it after that <laughs> I don't know but there is there is a fight between them and that's interesting so it really looks like this Comex situation will change now I mean it has been going on for a long time so it's really hard to wait on it but uh, when it disappears so we are free if, if we have a free price silver will go up a lot. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, interest for silver is coming a lot from the industrial side. Solar panels for one out of China, for example. I've been interviewing Jen Lin a couple times about this as well. He makes a really strong case for silver use in solar panels. Um, do you see the property of silver changing from a precious metal, currency metal, um, to, to more of an industrial metal, base metal uh, as well? Is, is that uh, uh, something you look at? I, I, I would say it's like a 50-50 metal, and that makes it unique. Because if you say copper, it's just an industrial metal. If you see gold, it's 90% investment and or jewelry, and 10% is going to the high-tech industry. So there, silver sits in a very unique position. And that's, uh, I mean, if, if the gold price goes up or, or so, the dealers, they put up premiums and so on. And that, I mean, it makes it harder for the price to really go up because people start to, to not invest anymore uh, buying coins. But in silver, if you get an, a physical shortage, all these car makers, all these, everything, they need the silver. So they will pay anything to get it and they want to have their own uh, reserves even. So, uh, because they can't, you cannot produce anything. You cannot produce a car nothing without silver even if it's just you only maybe need uh, one ounce maybe two ounces for a car and one ounce but if you without that one ounce you cannot do the car so when we see a physical uh, shortage uh, for industrial silver that is really really interesting so not a, a shortage on on coins or so on but the uh, industrial shortage on, on the big bars so in your fund the silver bullet fund how, how are you playing the space how are you investing what are you looking at uh, yeah, for us it's important. We we want to have a rather simple fund to make it accessible, so you get a, you get the full package with with the miners. Uh, and of course, uh, we look at uh, we want to have primary silver miners, uh, and that's a hard number if you look at revenue, as the gold price has been much higher than the silver price. But we want to be as as high as possible uh, the percentage of silver because so we don't go for the largest silver producer in the world but it should have a big effect on the company when the price of silver goes up and then uh, we look at uh, we want liquid stocks because we are a daily traded fund uh, doesn't cost anything to go in or out so so we have to be able to to sell if we have withdrawals uh, all the time uh, and then of course jurisdiction is important uh, with silver it's has been rather easy because like 60 percent comes from north and south america uh, starting to see some troubles there with before very uh, stable countries are getting a bit more unstable uh, for miners maybe uh, and then we look at the management so we are long only uh, i i would say uh, i mean a lot of people talk about seal mm -hmm. etf seal and uh, what we have done is, is a good construction. I mean, seal is not a good construction. You have like 25% in, in Wheaton. It's not even a miner. No. And then you have some uh, other strange company. Uh, and then you have a Korea Sink company. So 
it's a product that people talk about, but the construction of the fund is not that good. So we really uh, have focused on doing a fund that is uh, well constructed, but it's rather simple. It's long only, as I said, we don't go in or out the market. Uh, but still a much better product than uh, than uh, well there there are not too many silver miners to choose from especially like uh, I have a chart I think in in in, in my mind there might be 15 or so and primary silver producers there are probably three if you don't count like who comes to mind pan american silver i think they're even below 50% silver uh, yeah, first Hector. Majestic used to be 60, yeah. 70%. They're down below 50 now, depending on the gold price. I think it's yeah. also 50, 50. So ju just out of curiosity, who are the top three primary silver producers? Oh, well, the top uh, four holdings at the moment has been uh, Pan American Silver, as you said. Uh, first Majestic is there. They have had more problems than others. But And uh, Hecla, and, mm -hmm. and we have uh, Fortuna Silver, I think is on number four. Yeah, so but... they, they are a bit overweighted at the, uh, and then we have the next ones coming under there but as you said uh, the percentage is is hard to get high, high percent of silver uh, we have some new uh, as i have mentioned before i don't really talk about the companies around. you can see all our holdings on our web page so we are very transparent that's important for us mm -hmm. and we have them there and we have the the tickers and the prices on the holdings uh, in real time or 50 minutes delay mm -hmm. on the holdings uh and there are some new ones coming, uh, like I have said, Aya, had that they are really like 90 or 100% silver. So there are some some coming and some are trying to refocus back to silver. I think many have uh, defocused and going on to gold to make it more shop, uh, secure. I mean, when the prices were below 20, it's hard to be a primary silver miner. Right. And uh, and now we even see gold miners going for copper. So there, are, things are happening in the business uh, where they're going. Uh, we even so Barrick going for more copper. So uh, we try to hold. I th I think we would hold the full universe of silver miners that are not too small. Uh, on the other hand, if we see a big uptick, I mean, we expect the market to go up five, six, seven, eight hundred percent for sure in, in in the real secular bull market. And then the smaller ones, of course, they will grow a bit larger, more liquid, and more trades. So so we then it's easier for us. But anyway, we have a good construction and we have, uh, if we don't have uh, silver only, it, I mean, the rest is gold. So so yeah. it's a precious metal fund focusing on silver. Fantastic. Um, good, good. So let's, let's wrap up the precious metals discussion. I just want to end on talking about uh, base metals as well, because you run two. Um, one is a precious green fund. You actually have to explain what that means, precious green. And the other mm -hmm. one is more of a, I got to look up the name. I had it open here. Apologies. It is the AUAG Essential Metals Fund, Essential yeah. Metals. So um, quickly explain what Precious Green is and the Essential Metals for you. Yeah. Uh, well, Precious Green is our mo most defensive fund. It's a little bit different than other ones, a different animal, because we wanted to make a modern 60-40 portfolio. So we actually uh, took the 60% equity and put it into what we call Green Tech. And this Green Tech is divided in four different strategies. Uh, with 15% in each strategy. One is mining, uh, like copper and lithium, but we also have companies uh, producing uh, electricity, sun cell companies, and then we have uh, companies storing energy. And then we have one part for uh, recycling metals or saving energy. So they are not really in, in mining all these parts, but somehow they come together as a, a green, uh, the transition. And if we think the returns will be much better than the global boring uh, equity market. And the big one is on the 40% uh, of uh, bonds, we have uh, precious metals, but the commodities, not the stocks or so, or companies, uh, mainly gold. So the defense part of the 60-40 portfolio is, uh, if we say, the word, say it, make it easy, it's gold, uh, but we say precious metals, but it's, it's mostly gold. And we, we were talking about the perfect stone 2020, and we got it 2022. So, I mean, so the fund has been going up all the time. You cannot see COVID crash. You cannot see uh, anything. You cannot see the war. You cannot see interest rates. The fund has just been going up. And of course, it, uh, last year, going up 8% when the normal 60 40 portfolio was down a lot. Uh, so that has been a really a, a good, good concept. But it's a little bit different that we have this mix between equity and well, then, not bonds, but gold, the commodity. Uh, 
So that has been a success, I would say. And then the essential metals is the new fund, and there we focus on all metals to make it more broader, maybe more accessible for uh, institutional investors. They want to go into commodity space, uh, and then their silver bullet is maybe too too uh, too hot for them. <laughs> uh, and the essential metals like that would fit them if they want to go into commodity space, but we leave out oil and gas, and we leave out uh, food, uh, mm. and. Uh, on. So I think uh, that that's interesting, maybe for somebody looking for a broader exposure to the, some say the green metals. <laughs> we like, uh, I mean, copper is really interesting as well. I mean, we talk about silver, but I, uh, lithium, of course, interesting, but uh, copper is really getting hot because you need so much copper. Uh, yeah. And we need to talk about the price action in copper as well, because off camera, we have talked about copper price development just recently as well, because it has been under pressure, the, the, the base metals complex in general. I'm assuming due to recession fears, China's a, a slower like ramp up after COVID as well. Like, what, what's your perception of the, the base metals market now and uh, moving forward? Well, for sure, that was the, the China situation, I would say. I mean, they... they, they... I think they take like 60% of all the copper in the world. For, uh, so when they are slow, the world is slow. So uh, And uh, a lot of hedge funds uh, went short uh, on copper uh, as they saw this uh, recession risk and then this extra slow wake up from the COVID uh, hard lockdowns in China. Uh, but we have seen them reverse and that has strengthened the price uh, because they, of course, get afraid when uh, China opened uh, open their printing presses again and want to make some more stimulus because they can't uh, survive this slow speed. So so they, when the stimulus uh, rumors came, the, I think the hedge funds started to cover their short positions. And of course that raises the price. Uh, and I think we will see much higher prices in copper because again, uh, the US is going to change all the, the whole grid system and you need a lot of new copper to, to make that good. And, uh, you know, an EV using three times the amount of copper or four times sometimes, uh, and it's not so. On, on the battery side, it's more because you, you make more innovation. I mean, you have lithium batteries, but you have uh, sodium batteries, you have solid state glass batteries, new techniques coming there. So so that, and it maybe it's easier to, to get new lithium to the market. Uh, so when the prices go up, you get new, new uh, miners trying to maybe come into the market or they see they have more reserves and then they don't have so many reserves of price. I mean, you have seen the price go up 600%, five, 600%, <clears throat> and then it goes down 80%. So lithium is really volatile on, on that. I mean, you can make money on it, but it's uh, copper. It's harder to replace copper. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, as you said, you'll need it everywhere. So, and there's not enough of it. We, we don't need to go into supply and yeah, demand and, and, dynamics and, 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 right and now. Inventories, well. inventories, I mean, in, in LME, the inventories are made, like, I think in August, uh, there is no nothing left, so. Uh, uh, no, it's that's, uh, that's that's a whole different topic. Just looking at mine development as well. Uh, yeah, there's nothing coming on stream. Yeah, and so. you see these charts. They have to. I mean, in copper, they they need so much more uh, just for the transition. And then if China wakes up, I mean, they will consume a lot also. So uh, it's it's looking good for for copper. Fantastic, Eric. It has been an extremely insightful conversation. I, I extremely enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, let, let us know, where, where can we find more of you? Because I know you're also on Twitter and now Instagram. Yeah, uh, on Twitter, it's, uh, we are rather big. Uh, A-G, Eric. So that's easy, Eric with a C. Uh, on LinkedIn, of course, uh, on our webpage, aguagfunds.com. Uh, we have a newsletter there if you want that. And uh Instagram is really new. I I, I I guess I'm the latest person in going into Instagram. Uh, but I thought uh, we tried to be personal, uh, but on Instagram, I, I wanted to maybe show an even more personal side. Uh, let's see how that works. But uh, on Twitter, of course, it's easier. Are we going to see you dancing or so on, on Instagram? Any reels planned? Uh, well, you may <laughs> see some uh, yoga poses that oh, there are hard, you. Okay. But, but, but dancing, uh, well, no. that's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. It, I, I, I just watch reels from time to time. My kids are getting into it now as well, the YouTube shorts and things. Maybe so. I will see if I can find an old uh, fencing picture. I, I, I did fence a lot in the World Championships and so on, and was actually a German Witzemeister in uh, Vice no Germany. No I, I don't see the Burschenschaft, the scar, though. <laughs> I didn't get it. It was the other one. <laughs> it was the guy on the other side who got it. 
<laughs> this was wonderful. We'll have to have you yeah. back very, very soon. And uh, yeah. it's, it's good to see a good, good to chat with you and uh, yeah. all the best. So, and uh, everybody Thanks. else, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this conversation here at Soar Financial. We focus mostly on the macro to just understand the micro even, even better. We bring on fund managers, other market commentators to give you a really comprehensive view of what is happening in the markets. If you haven't done so, there's a subscribe button right there. Subscribe to the channel. This way we grow, we can bring on different guests. We can be even more appealing to some of the other fund managers in this sector. And uh, we hope we create even more and better content for you. Leave a comment, leave a like as well if you enjoyed this discussion. What do you think is happening? Is Eric's strategy the right one, the way he's doing his 60-40 fund, for example? Let us know. We want to hear from you. That's what this is here for. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.